If my family is my nation, then how can I be a citizen? If my street is my nation, would its laws be written in a way we can understand? So we can shake our neighbor's hand. United so we can cease to fight our fellow man. If my nation is my borough, would its focus be thorough? And how would we view others who we don't see as brothers? Or should I claim my city? Amidst the grimy and gritty concrete streets, could I seek to find that which uplifts me? And what about my country or my religion? Isn't that where my love's supposed to lie? But what if a strange war gets fought in her name which doesn't always seem right? So can competition be confined to a football field? Or do graveyards have to be filled with patriotic zeal? Now what about my colour? Doesn't that link me to another? Who shares the same struggle, my sister, my brother? But who then belongs and who gets pushed aside with the others? Do we separate the grades and shades to allocate who suffers? You see, we all seem to want to belong and just focus on our differences that are strong in us, so we look for groups. One to identify me, so I can wave my flag high and let it fly free, so I can cheer my team on by that I feel defines me. Whether it's right or it's wrong, it dignifies me. But my group can't be too big, and it can't be too diverse, because I want to feel that I'm elite, not common and cursed, because my group is the best group, and no man can test group. If you're north, then I'm south. If you're east, then I'm west group. It's difficult for us to imagine there's only one human race. But we like to cling on to our divisions and exhibit our hate. Maybe one day we'll listen to the wise men who say, we don't own Mother Earth. Mother Earth owns us. And everybody here is on a temporary stay. Thank you very much. OK, how are you guys doing? Everyone fine? As you can guess, I am a poet. My name is Mr. G, and um, I'm a, what's called a spoken word artist. So what I do for a living is I stand up in front of good people like yourselves, and I deliver poems like the one that I just delivered. And you know, that's how I pretty much you know, keep the roof above my head. It's not the most lucrative of professions. Um, I tend to get paid metaphorically, but <laughs> keeps me off the street, gets me out the house. Um, and I've been doing it for about 15 years. And what I found very interesting in the time I've been doing it is that it has introduced me to what I called the world of poetry. Now, you may not know this, but within poetry, there's a civil war going on, right? What we've got is stage poets. Stage poets like myself, right? We stand on stages and we do our performances, and that's what we do. And you can generally find us in dingy bars, and nightclubs, awful pubs, the kind of places where when you go to the toilet, there's a guy there handing you a tissue, right? <laughs> but it's a very underground scene, right? You know, very rarely you see us during the daytime. But, you know, I love it. I like to see it as being a continuation of the ancient oral tradition. But on the other hand, you've got established poets, the ones that are published, the ones that are written. Now, their brilliance and their excellence, it lies within the pages of a book. These are the guys you generally see during the daytime. These are the guys you generally see reciting in bookshops. They get invited to universities, and they do their recitals. And sad to say, the two of us don't necessarily get on. Because they're like the daywalkers, and we're like the zombies. They fear us because they think we're going to eat up their brains. But if you think about it, it's the same discipline, but we're just separated by technology. And now, in the 21st century, technology has changed. So now you're generally seeing the rise of the spoken word poet, because due to the internet and due to modern media, the printing press and the written word is not becoming obsolete. It's, I suppose, like just changing form. So now you can have a spoken word artist like a Holly Nish or George the Poet having millions and millions of views and using their spoken word art form and reaching the masses. And this causes a very, very interesting division. You know? It's a bit like... Fat Sam and Dandy Dan out of um, Bugsy Malone. You know what I mean, right? Just two different forms of thinking. And it's very, I suppose, strange when you're from one sector and you meet someone from another sector. One time, I was at a very posh event. It was a BBC event, right? A very, very posh event. And I did that same poem that I started off with. It's called Citizen G, right? And I did it. And there was a guy in the back, and he's a very well-known poet. You know, loads and loads of books. He's an established, published poet. And so he just looked at me, and I recognized him, and I looked at him. And I guess it was a bit like, you know, West Side Story at the beginning when we just started clicking our fingers. <laughs> yeah. 
And so he approached me, right? And he goes, oh, hi, oh, you're Mr. G, are you? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh, you're the guy from the radio. Yeah, that's me, right? And he goes, oh, you're one of those um, stage performance poets. I was like, yeah, that's me. Right? And he goes, I've, I've always struggled with that art form. I, I don't really see it as being proper poetry. It's more like rhyming doggerel. I was like, wow, where did that come from, man? No, because I might look like I'm born yesterday, but I was up all last night. I know an insult when I hear one, you know what I mean, right? You know? And I just said, oh, what do you mean by proper poetry? You know? And he pulled out one of his books, and it's a great book, you know, loads and loads of you know, like accolades and stuff like that. Showed me his book, and I was like looking at the book, and he read me out one of his poems. And it was beautiful. It was absolutely amazing. One of those ones that just touches your heart, touches your soul. It's like, wow. This guy's an amazing writer, right? But then he just says to me, you see, in my opinion, this is the reason why spoken word poetry will never have a long-lasting legacy. It's because it just doesn't translate well onto the page. And I was like, okay, I mean, what do you mean by long-lasting? And he goes, I'm talking about influencing generations to come. I mean, Mr. G, this is the type of poetry that has the chance to last forever. And I just smiled, man. I was like, wow, Ozymandias. <laughs> if you think that, if you believe what you're saying there, then you and I obviously have a different interpretation of what forever means. Let me qualify what I'm saying. My mind jumps between three different dates, right? A hundred thousand years ago, today, and a hundred thousand years to come. That's my past, present, and future just wrapped up. Now, the reason why I choose those dates, I do it purposefully, because it just eliminates the ego. It just levels the complete playing field. If you think about it, 100,000 years in the past, what's that? That's Fred Flintstone in bedrock, right? 100,000 years in the future, that's George Jetson in Orbital City. But the dates are so far from your conception, you can't even imagine them, that they may as well be the same date. So if you can imagine a bar where George Jetson and Fred Flintstone are sitting down and having a drink. That's where my mind occupies. Now let's look at 100,000 years ago. They called it the Middle Paleolithic era. Now what happened then that could influence people now? Well, the records are pretty sketchy. It's all conjecture. Some people say within that time that man left Africa and modern humans left Africa and replaced Neanderthals. And that would have been a big deal at the time. That would have been a Twitter trending topic. You can imagine the animals just thinking, bloody human immigrants coming over here, taking our jobs, right? You know? <laughs> and some people say that it was one group of people that left. And then from that group of people, all other men descended from. Now, my mind just wonders, like, who were that group? Like, and why did they leave? Did they get kicked out? Did they get lost? Did they just have extra air miles? They could travel further than anybody else? You know? And so, but archaeologists have looked and they found early signs within that period of art, culture, science, religion, trading. They've also found signs of territory, war, and dictatorships. And so, these essences from the past still have their bearing on the future. And I like to think that if there was art, religion, and science, and culture, and trading, there must have been poetry there. Because man has always had a need to artistically express himself, to try and grab, grapple with his existence, to try and look into the future, look into the past, look at nature, try and make some kind of sense of it all. And that's what artists do. That's what poets do. And that's a tradition where I see myself coming from. And so I laid that on him, man. Pow! Right? And I just said to him, look, I understand that you may not like what I do, but I've written a poem that would explain why I do what I do. And this poem was influenced by nature, the same way man is always influenced by nature. This poem is basically, it's an interpretation of a conversation I heard between two red-breast robins that were singing outside my window in the morning. Don't ask what I was snorting, but they were talking. Yeah? <laughs> two red-breast robins awoke early one morning, father and son sharing a moment of calling. In the magical hours between dewdrops when dawn, when all is calm with the world. Said son to father, Dad, why do we sing and puff up our chest and limber up our wings when it seems to me to be a bird is but a lowly thing? 
when man is in charge of this world. He builds a nest so high that it can make love to the sky. He wears feathers in all shapes and all colors and sizes. His wings are invisible, but yet he can fly so high. So why should we sing in this world? Said father to son, yeah, man indeed is strong. He has the pride of a peacock and the grace of a swan. He even goes a little cuckoo when the weather goes wrong. For he believes that he's in charge of this world. He puts a feather in his cap as he tries to rule the roost. But whenever he gets scared, he feels the bump of a goose. Because we used to be dinosaurs. And that's the truth. And my son, that's why we'll always sing in this world. Thank you. <laughs> well, what about the future? What about being fast and curious and looking beyond the present moment? Surely legacy's got a relevance then. Think about it. A hundred thousand years in the future. What possible effect could we have now that we project into the future? A hundred thousand years. The English language might be barely recognizable. Have you ever tried reading something from a thousand years ago? That's like playing snake on a Nokia 3210, man. You know what I mean? This just don't make sense, right? And even like the stars that we see in the sky, the constellations would have completely changed. So the night sky from today would be unrecognizable in the future. Yeah? And how would future man view man of today? The same way we view middle Paleolithic man. The great metropolises, the New Yorks and the Parises and the Bangkoks and the Shanghais and the Johannesburgs, right? They might just be dust. We might just be sifting through them, picking up odd artifacts, looking at things and saying, oh, these people obviously worship the god of Apple, and <laughs> Starbucks played a big part role in their life, right? <laughs> and, and those Nike shoes just allowed them to fly, you know what I mean, right? It's just, it'll be pure conjecture. You just don't know. And what will the future hold? I mean, will we have any resources in the future? Would we have bombed ourselves in, back into the Stone Age? Would Dr. Dre finally release his third album, Detox? These are things I need to know, you know? And then that made me start to think about legacy. And in that way, I had to agree with my fellow poet. And I started to think, wow, here's me and you. We're both poets, and we're having a stupid, bickering argument over which words are better. Words written, words spoken. Who cares? In the beginning, there was the word. And in the end, there will be the word. And we will always need beautiful words to navigate us through the spectrum of life. Because the reason why poetry is important, and the reason why man will always look to the artist and look to the poets, is because we want to hear beautiful words to get us through the ugly circumstances. We need to make sense of our existence. So it doesn't matter what your discipline is, right? It doesn't matter where you hold from. You can be a scientist, you can be an artist, you can be a journalist, you can be whatever. The fact is, is that if you still have this bickering, divisive mindset, right, that will be the legacy we project into the future. Even after all the famous names and the famous celebrities and who did this and who did that becomes mixed up in the jumble of history and just consigned it just being this era. So I'd like to leave you with a poem that's inspired by Martin Luther King. Because that's where I just, sometimes when I get involved in these little stupid, tiny little arguments and the lower part of me just comes out and you become very, right? I just have to think, okay, I want to become better than that. Because if I, in my small, little, insignificant, unrecognizable role as a poet can be better than that, then hopefully the love that I plant today will grow into the future. So this poem I'd like to finish with is called Go Tell It on the Mountain. I caught the falling feather of an angel's wing, and I wanted it tattooed upon my spine. You can call me a devil or a demonic thing. Who cares for names if I can fly? Who cares for names if I can rise and claim what's rightfully mine, beyond the foot of this crooked mountain which casts a haze upon my life? You know it's impacting how I'm living. You know it's exact and unforgiving. It traps my soul within a box and holds a lock to my upliftment. I just want to float away so high. I just want to break the color lines. I want to break the minimum wage and slavery break the cannons, guns, and knives. That I could escape the prison time. Escape the trips to courtroom trials. I could rewind the school exclusions when daddy leaves and mommy cries. Am I wrong to want to escape this plight? These angel wings give me insight. They'll never take my mental state to leave these shackles far behind, but falling wings, these scattered feathers. And I tried my best to just collect them, but they were spread all oh so far apart to unite them all would take forever. So I gathered just what I could. 
Look to the stars from where I stood. That I could leave behind this mountain, behind this city, behind this hood, behind this street, behind this road, behind a path that leaves me cold. I'll fly so high they'll never find me. I'll never go back to the days of old. But as I flap and flap and flap, there are no wings upon my back. There is no magical elevation. My puppet strings are still attached. I raise my eyes up to the sky. I look way beyond this mountain high. I look to the heavens and just ask why this world won't get off my back and let me fly. I'm stuck at the bottom with my regrets, with that single feather that I now possess. One day we'll reach that mountain top, but we'll have to do it step by step. Thank you very much.